Now I want you all, if you can, to get up out of your chair and come toward your set. That's it. Just come toward your set. Right smack in front of the screen. Stop about four feet away. Okay, now sort of bend down and look at the right middle margin of your screen. What do you see? You see an X, a black X, right? Nothing else. You see nothing else. Okay, now cover your right eye and stare, stare right at that X. What do you see? Same thing, right? No change at all. Is that right? Oh, is it right? Glance over to the left margin with your left eye. Keep your right eye covered. Now what do you see? Ah, you see more possibilities that weren't there, right? A circle, a black dot. Well, now look back over at the X. Keep your right eye covered. What do you see? Doesn't it look like before? You know the dot is there, but it's not there. But it will be there, or it was there, and is, is there all at the same time. So isn't this a remarkable thing? The dot is there, it was there, and it very soon will be there all at the same time, because you know it was there all the time, but it wasn't there. Why? Simply because the, your, your, the intensity of your awareness was not maximal, which is a definition of present time. Past and future are, are, are conditioned by intensity of awareness of possibilities that is less than maximal, some very distant that you, you can barely remember them, or so far in the future you can barely conceive them. These are remote intensity awareness, but when it's maximal, it's your present time. But all these tenses are with you at the same time, you see? Time isn't something that begins in a distant past, progressing at a constant velocity toward an uh, unimaginable distant future. It's not that objective. It's subjective and it's different for each of us. We've been discussing pure reason, and of course we all assume that that resides in the mind. What is the mind exactly? Well, first of all, it's impossible to define right now. Scientists can't agree. We don't even know where it exists. We don't know how it functions, and we really don't know what thought is. We can't even define that well. But let's look at what it could be. For example, look at your screen, and what do you see? You see certain possibilities that don't change, mainly just black lines in certain configurations. Now some of you will say that's a picture, a drawing, of a young, attractive young lady looking back to the right. But if you look closer, some of you will see something else in that same thing. You will see an old hag looking at you to your right. Notice that the chin of the young lady is the big nose of the old hag. It's an old trick they use in psychology books. What's happened here? Possibilities never changed. Yet some of you, with your minds, interpreted this to be a young lady. The others interpreted it to be an old hag. And your own mind will switch from one to the other rapidly. Difficult to take both in at the same time. So we have good definitions now of mind. That is, mind is the categorization of the type or quality of the possibilities perceived. Some of you categorize the same possibilities as young woman, others as old hag. And language is simply the naming of those categories, young woman or old hag. So using our same assumptions, we come up with workable definitions of mind and language.